because nobody really talks about on ground work you know uh, because when you go on set it's an altogether different uh, it's it's a it's a different ball game altogether i mean yes you are in your method and you are in your character and everything but then this is what i what i was uh, i was absolutely puzzled with this thought for weeks months on end i have asked who and who in uh, within my fraternity uh, to possibly uh, help me out with with this uh, you know problem that i uh, face almost every time i go into uh, uh, on on camera and i have had vague answers i have not had answers i have had uh, answers that i was not convinced with and i and i understand that this is there is no shortcut to uh, getting this corrected uh, you have to memorize it it's probably part of uh, you know how a, a choreographer would choreograph a dance sequence probably it's something on those lines i understand that uh, but yeah the challenge lies is when you do not have that kind of time you know and how do you do that and do you heavily rely on the monitor uh, once you're done with the shot and sometimes when you are uh, a newbie like i am you know i uh, am not a senior actor i have just started working uh, you cannot even go through the rushes it's not a very uh, easy thing very good well that's why we're doing this and uh, i'm just uh, delighted that we had a, an opening in the schedule to bring this topic in uh so let me do a formal introduction <clears throat> uh hello and welcome to michael chekhov masters talk i am lisa dalton and i am here today to talk about the concept of matching for on camera work so we're going to talk about what that is and i'm going to share some suggestions and tips that i have so uh the inspiration for this is uh rohan who is in india and uh rohan wrote to me and asked me to address this topic so you've just been hearing rohan talk about his situation uh doing a soap opera in mumbai and so i'm going to um begin with first of all thank you rohan for um bringing this topic and uh to give a little bit of context for me personally i basically made my living for uh 40 years in front of the camera but um my on on set uh soap opera experience was as an actress back in the uh 1970s and 1980s so the techniques were a bit different than they are now but um uh but i absolutely understand the pace that is generally uh gone at and uh so i, I will talk a little bit about that and to give us some context uh about that uh for the way uh, first how i experienced it and how it was different and perhaps a little bit easier then for us everything was on multiple camera and so we actually rehearsed the show in the order that it was shot and then and there were three or four cameras and everything was edited and it was actually aired live when i started in the 1970s on soap operas uh soap operas were my first professional on camera jobs uh i did a a show called the edge of night and uh, later i did as the world turns and uh during so during that time because there were multiple cameras it was done with a live switch that uh your your scene was only shot one time and it was aired the way it was it went straight on air later on in the 80s we were doing uh what they called pre-taping so we'd rehearse the scene and shoot the scene and then move to the next set rehearse the scene shoot the scene 
and uh, but we still had four cameras they were taping and they were still editing live because what they shot was then aired that later in the day that very same day so uh, what we did not have which it sounds to me and Rohan you can correct me if I'm uh, wrong but what we did not have was the classic film structured setup of what we call a master scene. So a master scene sh sequence of shooting is where the uh, wide shot of a scene is shot and that's called the master. And then from there, the camera then moves its angle and goes to shoot a medium shot. And from there, and there may be one or two or even three medium shots which change the angle, but at least one medium shot. And we do the whole scene again in the medium shot and then we cover the scene, what they call covering the scene by changing the camera, of the, uh, camera angle and shooting a close up of one of the actors and then changing the angle and shooting the close up of the other actors. And then they have what they call inserts, which are um, separate moments or cutaways where they show the clock or they show an object that you're writing, uh, a contract, whatever the prop may be, a close-up of that. So the construct of a master scene requires an actor to be able to repeat their performance and what we're talking about today is matching and matching the physical behavior for each of those takes. And if you add it up, you might do two, three takes of the master and then two or three of the close up and then two or three of your uh, of the medium shot and two or three of the close up. And so you easily can do a scene 10 times. And even if you're just doing the scene with only one take for, for each setup, you're still doing the scene at least four times. And there is a member of the set who is working with a script and they are called the continuity or script supervisor who that person's job is to make sure you said the correct words that are in the script and to notate your actions and to notate for the cinematographer and for the director what shots have been taken. So for example, if they do three takes of the master shot, that script supervisor is going to have notes for what happened on each of the takes and that director and cinematographer may turn to the continuity script supervisor at the end of those three takes and say circle take three. And that means that continuity person is going to highlight number three, circle it on their notes. And that is gonna go, that list of notes is then going to the editor. The editor takes that circle take and they uh, use that as their start point. So if there are two circle takes, it means that the director is considering that they liked both of them and it may be the editor's decision. And that decision might be completely changed if you did not put your hand on your face and the right word, or if you scratched your eyebrow and a different place in take one versus take two of the master and the take that they like of the medium shot or of the close up. So in the master, if my hand starts to be moving somewhere in space like this, and they're gonna cut to the medium shot, it needs to continue from the same spot. Otherwise it's gonna go, it's gonna be here and then suddenly it, it's here and there's a jump. Sure. And that discontinuity is jarring for the viewer. Now, there are a couple of things that have happened in cinematic uh, techniques that make it a, li a little less problematic. And one of those is that since the 90s, we have had um, 
TV shows that move the camera around and use the you know, jarring camera as an actual technique. So people's eyes are a little more accustomed to what they call a jump cut. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still the ideal actor would like to become editable and would like to become a favorite of the editors. So an editor loves the actor who can offer that consistent continuity uh, because it gives them freedom instead of forcing them to take a less exciting take of your performance uh, because you did something spontaneous that didn't match the earlier things um, and having to take a more, you know, a, a, a less exciting event. So that's, that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at this, how do we match? And in Rohan's situation, so Rohan, I, uh, you can share with us a little bit more. Do you rehearse and then shoot? Are they shooting on multiple cameras? Uh, tell us a little more, if you can, about your the structure of your shooting process. So yes, there is uh, multiple. There are multiple cameras for sure. Uh, sometimes three, sometimes two, and uh, because of the COVID nineteen, now we do not get to rehearse. Uh, you know, uh, in a group of there are more than one actors. We really don't get to rehearse together. Uh, earlier, we we had that uh, opportunity. Uh, we could just be in, you know, the other co-actors' green room and probably do a scene together, then come out and and uh, you know uh, be ready for the camera. Uh, but now the the situation is such that uh, you know there's even a distance while uh, two actors being in a frame. There has to be a, a certain distance uh, for both the actors, and then the camera is placed. That you know. Uh, so what I'm trying to say essentially is that. No, we are not rehearsing it now. Indian television, again, uh, because it's so fast paced and everything is time bound and we need to have a, a, at least um, a normal episode runs for about 22 minutes. So uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the creative team needs to have those 22 minutes uh, done in a day or two days at max. That's the kind of speed we are working with. So everything happens at break, uh, breakneck speed and everything is, you know, there's everything else to do but rehearse. So even though we are uh, rehearsing, we are, we are obviously learning the lines and, and the text and, and we're trying to figure out and memorize. But there is something like you mentioned, which is spontaneity as well. I may have rehearsed it, you know, like a few times. Uh, alone or in my in my own space, but when I come on camera, it's just that moment. I probably have something that triggers, and you know, another movement comes out. So, with me, sometimes I cannot control that. So, if I feel that this is the flow, then I let let that go. But then, because I haven't rehearsed it, then I do not remember in the master shot. And then my only bet is to either ask one of the makeup guys, which I used to do till, uh, you know, before the, the lockdown happened, that I used to ask one of the crew members to uh, sneakily, you know, capture the master shot on my phone, record it. Then I would go back into my green room and see that tape on my mobile phone. And that's how I know that, okay, this is what I have done. And then try and match that uh, in the close-ups you know, in, in the different takes. Uh, sometimes I was successful, sometimes I wasn't. And uh, I, as an actor, want to be uh, in control of what I'm doing. You know, it cannot just come as a surprise to the audience that, okay, there's a jerk that is happening. There's, there's uh, you know, there's, there's a, a, a something which is not correct uh, to, the, to the viewer on screen. And you, can, and you can figure these tiny little nuances. It, it is not so much that uh, a, a normal audience cannot really grasp. So, and it looks really odd on screen, you know. And even though I may have given a great take, I was in the character, I have said it with emotions and everything, uh, 
but because of that technicality it looks pretty odd you know and i want to eliminate that aspect from my act Okay, great. So we're going to dig in now and I'm going to talk for a bit about um, some overall concepts and, uh, and let's see what happens. Okay. So to begin with, um, we're not, uh, so uh, we, I have this saying, which is strong preparation makes the action effortless. And what that means is that if you really prepare well, then while you're doing it, things flow in an easy manner. What we're experiencing here is a lack of preparation. We're looking at the challenge, and Mr. Chekhov always said, we want to fall in love with the problem. So falling in love with the problem is what we're looking to do. And when we fall in love with the problem, we start looking for creative ways. And when you first posed this question to me, Rohan, uh, I, I knew exactly what the challenge was. And, uh, and so I just really sort of began inviting um, Mr. Chekhov to appear in my imagination and some of my other inspirations, Mala Powers and Jack Colvin. And uh, we'll say in the beginning, you know, Mr. Chekhov himself struggled very much with the limitations of the on-camera situation. And he developed this falling in love with the problem idea to be able to cope with these limitations, this lack of rehearsal, this lack of sort of continuity and what to do when you're in states of inspiration and spontaneous changes occur. So, to begin with, some of our ideas are going, they, they do really rely upon uh, preparation for yourself as an actor. And I will be talking about using the technique itself. And so in order to fully be able to use these techniques, you will need to practice them. So what it's not likely you're going to get instant, absolutely instant, results uh, because it's we're going we're talking about building muscles so i'm going to start with a process that mr chekhov called flying back or spying back and he used both words he used spy back when he was with jack colvin he used fly back when he was with, with mala powers and they meant the same thing uh, Jack Colvin was a very shrewd, intellectual uh, person and very psychologically brilliant person. And Mala was a more uh, emotionally driven artist uh, as opposed to an intellectually driven artist. And so flying back uh, for Mala and spying back for Jack. Uh, was the, were the terms and you can use whichever and maybe you get something slightly different from each. The process is when you do something to review it, to do an, a mental or imaginary or kinesthetic review of what you've done and identify the, so it's your own video playback inside and the process is a technique which is like a muscle this aspect of memory so i am sure that when uh, and i know this is true for myself that if i haven't been practicing memorizing it's harder for me to memorize but if i've been memorizing and memorizing and memorizing that is a skill set to i begin it becomes easier and easier for me to memorize so the process in the flyback, which is the word that I tend to use, um, the flying back process is where you, in your imagination, review and you do your imaginary playback where you watch in your imagination what you've done. And out of what you've done, you identify the parts that are really favorite parts where you were happy. And it's very important that you ask what you were happy about. What was I happy about with that? And 
if I got to do it again, so this is question number two, one, what was I happy about? Number two, if I get to do it again, what would I like to do differently? And number three, what was my favorite moment? So this process of flying back is a way of building inspiration to uh, want to keep working and or keep rehearsing. And the flyback process begins in your actual training so that when you do your exercises, for example, if you do expanding and contracting, in that process, you set out with an aim. I'm going to expand my energy and I imagine my energy and I allow my body to really radiate out there. And then I come back. So now I'm going to practice. Uh, so I do that. I do it again. I do it again. But if I've not paused in between each time and done a flyback, I don't really know what I did. And I don't really know what to change for my second version. So if I do my expansion and my contraction, and then I fly back, I realize, you know what? On a scale of zero to 10, if 10 is the most expanded, I really only got to an eight. When I know that I got to an eight. What, did I, do I like that? Was I aiming for a 10? Yeah, I was aiming for a 10. So what am I going to do differently? I'm going to allow myself to expand out to a 12. <laughs> and I'm going to go and take this direction to myself really strongly. I'm going to really allow myself to expand more and more fully. And But my favorite part was that I really got, even though I only went to an eight, I really got from zero to one to two to three to four to five to six to seven to eight. And I like that because the time before that, I jumped from a two to an eight and I missed my transition. So um, my favorite moment was going from the four to the five because I really found that nuance. So now I have a plan. I'm excited about what I've done and I'm excited for what's to come. So right, right in your everyday exercising as an actor, you are flying back, building this muscle. So the muscle that we're building is the muscle of a split consciousness. And that split consciousness has one part of you, the creative intellect, which is working on saying the lines, hitting the marks that we've set, and being responsive, saying the correct words, allowing all that to happen. Another part, the creative individuality part of the artist, is streaming in the character or focusing on the expansion of the moment, whatever the artistic tool is that you're using. And another part is recording and witnessing. And it's from the camera's point of view there, or the audience's point of view if you're on stage. This witness is whose muscle we are developing. And the witness needs to be able to record and play back without interfering with the creative impulse or the physical necessities of the scene. And so it is absolutely a muscle that needs to be built right from the very initial phases of your training. In Michael Chekhov's technique, the training itself can be broken down into sections. And the very first fundamental part of the training, as we see on this chart of inspired action, is the psychophysical work. This psychophysical work is what allows your body to build the skill set to reveal your imagination so that we eliminate the painful situation where we are having a great idea and we go to do it and it just doesn't come out at all the way we hoped it would. Once we can heal the gap between the body and the imagination 
through these psychophysical exercises. The next task of the artist is really to fulfill the emotional life. And so there are, uh, there's a series of exercises. So the psychophysical exercises include expanding and contracting, molding, flowing, flying, radiating the four qualities of movement based on the elements and the basic archetypal gestures push, pull, lift, smash, gather, throw, and whatever anyone else wants to add to that because Chekhov didn't create one final list. And uh, bridging that to the emotional world are the three sister sensations of equilibrium, balancing, falling, and floating. And there are videos on all of these that I have made. So as, as the emotional life comes in, then we also have qualities and sensations and we have atmospheres. And, uh, but the central task for our, uh, my goal here today in matching lies in the next section, which is characterization. So in characterization, we are, uh, uh, so to go back to the psychophysical exercises, especially in your field of archetypal gesture, we are there linking with objective. So when we know what the essential gestures are in terms of our character for the scene, uh, connecting gesture with the emotional life uh, will give us uh, what we call the most central conditions of acting, which is that the character has a strong drive to do what they're trying to do and they have emotional responses to the success or the failure of that. But where we really are uh, transformative, super transformative is in the field of characterization. And that it, the basic tools for that are centers, imaginary bodies, thinking, feeling and willing and radiating and receiving and also disguises. And not everyone has to deal with disguises, but in soap operas, in particular, we are often dealing with disguises. We have a lot of lying, cheating, and manipulating going on, at least in American soap operas. <laughs> so we have affairs, secret affairs, and we have plots to manipulate and control people. So disguises become uh, very important. And, uh, and, and then we have uh, the other elements that support leading to psychological gesture. So the fundamental principle that I want to bring forward in for matching is understanding really clear, clearly through the technique what your character's characterization elements are and being so clear on those that they become instinctive. And when they are instinctive, the impulses will draw you to motions that are more consistent. So I'm going to jump to specifically an example of thinking, feeling, and willing. So Michael Chekhov, when he was coaching Mala Powers on her starring roles, both on, on film and on stage. One of the first two questions he would ask her is, is your character predominantly thinking, feeling, or willing, and how does that differ from your own? And the other main question was, is your character predominantly radiating or receiving? And so, when you understand through Michael Chekhov's terms what your character is, it becomes more uh, available. What becomes available to you is a certain movement pattern consistency. So if we look at a thinking dominated character, a thinking dominated character tends to have strong energy in their forehead. They tend to use their index finger. They tend to move in straight lines and they tend to be a little bit more crisp in their speaking. 
with their T's, P's, K's, things like that. And their gestures tend to be higher. So their gestures will tend to be from the eyebrows up or they'll be around the shoulder. And so I'm going to take a drink and, I, and I'm gonna pick up my cup. And if you notice what I've done with my hand in picking up my cup is I have this finger out and I'm going to take a sip. And I'm bringing it now, that might not appear straight to you, but that I'm bringing it straight away from me. And now I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna um, talk to you for a moment while I'm holding my cup, okay? And, and so I've got this finger here, and it's right at my shoulder, shoulder level. And my head is tilting a little to the right. Okay, it's tilting toward the cup. I'm holding it with my right hand and my finger is up here. Okay, and it's going straight down to the table. And when I bring my hand back, I still have this finger slightly dominant. Can you see that? At this finger is still, it's not here, it's not here. It's still, that finger still has a, a prominence because I'm in this thinking mode. And so I tend to be gesturing, impulses tend to be coming out of there. Again, I'm keeping it at shoulder height and I'm, or I'm bringing it up here. So if I'm making a point to you, it's gonna come up here as opposed to here, which is down right down my more by my chin and when when i'm really taught you know concentrating on that this is just the way it's going to be because i am that kind of character i move in these types of patterns now suppose i'm a feeling dominated character and as a feeling dominated character um my uh, my, I'm going to tend to favor to my left side. And when I go to pick up the, um, pick up my mug, I pick it up here. I pick it up in the middle there. And I'm going to hold it more in my feeling forces or by my cheek. So, and when I pick it up, it's going to come, it's going to round. I'm going to show more of the inside of my palms, for example my middle finger is going to be a little bit more active. So yeah, my, my, it's going to lead, if I'm talking, I'm going to lead a little bit more with that middle finger. I'm going to, it's going to, my gesture is going to curve around in and out and I'm going to be tilting off to my left side. Now, when I understand these kinds of things, as opposed to, um, uh, if I'm a will-dominated person, everything's down in the bottom and it's more angular uh, rather than straight line, for example. So, um, so you know, I might even grab my, my mug like this if I need to, um, but I'm going to definitely have a feature, a stronger thumb. I'm going to be more likely to grab it down by the bottom and I'm going to I probably, I might not even have the mug in the frame. My jaw is gonna be stronger and uh, I'm gonna be in more angles. I'm gonna be a little more erratic or square on uh, with that force. So when I know that I, my character is a certain predominance, I build a consistent way of manipulating props and costumes wardrobe and gestures so that there is a, a dominant center um, in each part of my body so that if my if there's an insert that's on my hand signing a contract grabbing a pen um, I know because I'm thinking I'm always going for the tops of everything or I know because I'm feeling I'm always going for the middles of things or because I'm on the will force I'm down on the bottom so when you make these decisions about your character for thinking, feeling, willing, it gives you 
a consistent movement pattern. So you, if you're a slightly off, you're not so far off that you're here as opposed to here, right? You're not so far off that you're, you know, you're here as opposed to here because you know, you know that the way you hold a pen because you're thinking dominated, it has a different pattern to it than if you're feeling dominated and you write a little bit differently or, right? So you, when you, so this is all preparation. This is all work that you get to do on your own before you ever get to the set so that you really start to refine who your character is. Now, you have an established character, so you may need to go back and just start observing what do you tend to do. You, you may need to go look at replays and go, wow, well, I never thought about whether I was a thinking, feeling, or willing character. What am I? What is, who is this character? And you might not have a clear path with it, and so you might feel like developing one for the future. And when you develop a character in a series, you always want to develop it in relation to the storyline and the other characters. So your character always plays a function in the story to create conflict. So this question of, do you create conflict, more conflict by being in your thinking forces in by your character being feeling force or by your character being will force and what kind of thinking force what kind of feeling force what kind of will force again there are videos on that um, but you want to make those decisions in relation to the people that you're in most of your scenes with so there might be a cast of 20 but your scenes tend to be with these five or six people so you want to look at those people and you want to find the most opposite from them. So if you are with a, uh, if your character is in love with a female doctor who's just very, very smart, then you're all about getting her out of your out of her medical head and into romance, then you're a feeling dominated person. Yeah. This contrast is going to create a really dynamic, exciting tension there. And it can be quite a bit of fun to play. So look at uh, all the characters around you, look at who you've been uh, and study your text to identify the character's predominance. Now, with that said, we also have the concept of the psychological gesture, which is the uh, movement that done with one breath that uh, in one inhale and exhale just basically incarnates the character onto you and aligns your thinking forces with the characters, your feeling forces with the characters, and your will forces with the characters' um, will forces, and brings their imaginary body and center into you in their personal atmosphere instantly. So with that, we'll look at just this, the personal atmosphere, which bridges, in terms of atmosphere, it bridges the field between the feeling forces and characterization. The personal atmosphere is the aura and what is the vibration in the aura. And so this aura is formed by these archetypal tendencies that the character carries around with them. So uh, those tendencies can be tilted in our storytelling toward the professions so a certain doctor-ness, a certain police officer-ness, a certain businessman-ness that you, Rohan, would have, right? So the essence of the character has is primarily a social type. 
And that social type is one of the things that's creating the tension in the storytelling and is important for believability in the storyline that the, the audience needs to feel that you have enough intelligence to be a doctor or to, enough authority to, to be a police officer or enough compassion to be a teacher, uh, enough shrewd, you know, uh, danger to be a, a, you know, a villain, whatever that role is that you're playing. So it's important for you to understand that. And in order to create your multidimensionality within the archetype, you always want to understand the shadow side, especially in the um, world of soap opera, where it lives in the shadows uh, quite a bit. So we're playing, we're looking at the dark, the dark personality forces and how they strive to um, get to power, to get to money, to get love, to get control, uh, the, these kinds of um, elements that are in, in many of these stories. So the, uh, if the character is a teacher, the teacher has its, you know, holiness, you could say, uh, the police officer has their sense of authority and to protect, uh, the doctor has their sense to heal. However, there's a shadow side for all of them. And so whatever archetype you're in, you want to make sure you understand the shadow side of it so that we have a multidimensional character. And understanding that shadow side, which is uh, which when we, if you look at some of the videos on psychological gesture, where I talk about the three part compositionary gesture, uh, this will go into great detail about it. Um, but it, with that, you come up with three basic gestures for your character. One gesture is the gesture that you use most of the time to get what you need. So if you are basically someone who pulls people to them, you are a shrewd business person and you um, manipulate people by making them think that you are their best friend and you lure them to you before you sort of latch on and take power over them or you're a person who goes through life pushing and forcing your thoughts, ideas, way of controlling your wants on other people. So you have a basic gesture that goes from you and forces them that way. So just as an example of two different kinds of gestures for your core, your basic psychological gesture. This is primary operating means for this character. Now you want to find the wounded, the trigger point. What is the, that character's worst nightmare? What is the wound? What is the hurt? What is the pain that they're trying to get away from that they're experiencing now that they never want to experience again or that they had in the past? What is that terrible thing they're trying to avoid? And come up with a gesture for that. And the opposite of that, which as Mr. Chekhov says, we live with an image of our objective fulfilled. And that is the expression of victory, of transformed, of 100% success. And these gestures are gestures that uh, if you have a set field of gestures, these large physical movements can be what we call veiled, mean made invisible and yet radiating through the veil power uh, so that they become what we call habitual and emphatic gestures. So 
The psychological gesture is a large full body movement. It's actually an idea or an image that you express in a large full body movement that no one would ever actually see. But when you do that together with your physical body and your energy body, your etheric forces, your prana, um, when you do it using that, it goes way beyond your physical body. And then you can start to decrease the amount that the physical body expresses or reveals without losing the radiant prana, chi, ki, etheric forces that go out into space and travel. And when you do that, the amount that the physical body moves is less and less. So if the, the full psychological gesture comes like this, and there's a whole body movement, my legs are doing something, every part of my body's in it, and it's coming like this, there's, you can see there's an action in my shoulders, there's a neck pulled back, my hand is pushing stuff away from me and I'm pulling away from it. And uh, when I just start to imagine that, then what it becomes is something just like this. And that little move contains the power of this in my imagination. So when I, so I, I feel that gesture. Now this gesture um, turns, gets, turns into uh, an emphatic gesture, which is a actual movement that the camera sees uh, or the audience sees that looks like you're just making a point of emphasis. So I'm talking to you and I'm, and, and I'm, and I'm saying this is not a great idea. And you can see that that is a small version of this. This is what I'm disguising inside, like, don't do that. But what you see is, no, that's not really a good idea. And I can make that really small, very small, just like, not a good idea. And I see my shoulder goes up very, very subtly. The head turns, the, it comes back a little bit, and, it's, and the, the hand comes forward. So when i know uh what where in so that that's my like lost gestures like no oh, there um but my let's say my my victory gesture is having you in a full embrace okay so I'm, I'm, I'm instead of in this way i'm coming in here i'm coming in here there and so uh i'm thinking you know why don't we have lunch today there. It is my line. Why don't we have lunch today? And I'm doing a small version of this big gather, which clutches in here. And um, I've got gotcha. you. Yeah. And so this, this little, this becomes sort of a, a it's just a, it's just a little gesture. It seems like just a nothing gesture to the viewer, but it is psychologically gathering them right in, pulling in your victim there and you know you're kind you're pulling them right to wherever it is depending on if you're a thinking dominated character a feeling dominated character will dominated character you'll pull them to you know a, a point more in alignment with that consistently so when you these basic gestures might would be through my whole character like every the the, the these are just basic gestures of my character and they come in uh, this one I tend to do in variations. It can be done both hands, whatever. I do variations of this one, again, can be variations of which hand. But it's going, they're going to get a little larger when I'm in, what, uh, in more trouble or a little larger. This one's going to get bigger when I'm in more danger and I'm losing. And the other one's going to get a little bigger when I'm really getting closer to Know, victory of it. So having your victory gesture and your your defeat gesture or your wounded gesture, your your loss gesture, uh, and that core way of 
you know, either being someone who, who pushes their way in, for example, pushes, you could be a smasher, whatever, um, you know, or pulls their way through. Um, when you, when you have these anchored and they're deeply prepared, every script you get, you can look at and very quickly identify where you are on this scale of winning and losing. With, in this scene, every scene needs to have a power shift in it. If the scene doesn't have a power shift in it, it, it might not be, um, it, it, you know, and it could, it could be a segment of a scene, like you could shoot this scene with Marianne, we, we shoot this scene and then another scene is edited to, you know, we cut to other characters, cut to other characters and come back to the ending, the last part of my scene with Marianne. And so those, those two scenes are really one scene. And it may be that the power shift happens between these two. But very often these, the edits in soap operas end right in the process of shifting the power. So we have what we call the sustaining process. Like we lingering, we, we can see she's starting to get control and he's struggling. And then we cut and we go to the next. So we keep the audience in this hanging. We never quite, you know, the explosion happens in the middle of the scene and a twist happens at the end to keep us hanging. So you wanna understand the construct of each scene where are you winning? Where are you losing? So when you know that, that's going to start when you're, and again, it's like a muscle, you'll start to be able to recognize it faster and faster. So it'll take you less and less time to see the, where the power shifts in your scene. And if you have, uh, if you have these basic psychological gestures that represent the main operating mechanism and you're winning and losing, you can track exactly where you're winning, exactly where you're losing, and you start to utilize mannerisms related to the winning and the losing. So you develop a certain alphabet or vocabulary of movements that are related to your character. When you have that vocabulary and you have your characterization, you start to uh, be able to remember, you know, along with building this flyback process, you start to remember more and more what you did. So the flyback process be has to begin in your rehearsals. So you start to build that muscle. And, uh, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about is um, you, you mentioned that you don't get to see rushes anymore. And that's, that's definitely a challenge. Um, in the, in the um, situation of the COVID, uh, it might be worth having a conversation Certainly, if you have a friend in the cast who's been who has a little more authority power, been on the on the team longer, uh, to have a phone call with them, uh, even dressing room to dressing room, <laughs> you could have. Um, and because you can't go into each other's green rooms and rehearse, there still is if you have the option. Um, you, you still could on your phones. You could do a little Zoom meeting and do a little rehearsal on your phone. So to cr oh, fall in love with the problem, um, consider asking for more support from the production by getting uh, aligning someone on your team to see whether or not they would find it. If, if the actors in general could be helped by this, uh, if there's a way for it to, to happen, that would be every the producers would like that they uh if if there was a technical way that they could support you with the um, uh, option for some playback that that could be very helpful in light of what's happening 
So how does that feel? How do those ideas feel, Rohan? To be, to be very honest, Lisa, uh, I'm still in the, in the process of understanding the Chekhov technique. I have been uh, going through most of the videos. Um, I, I was even reading um, uh, Leonard Petit's uh, book, the, the handbook. So I'm in the in the process of reading that as we speak. So I'm like reading uh, every day, like a few pages, trying to grasp what he's talking about. So uh, my um, my challenges with the, uh, the technique is, you know, from a very very uh, beginner's point of view, because I'm still trying to uh, come to terms with the exercises, uh, you know, the psychological gestures and the archetypal and the sensations and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, uh, one thing which I am sort of clear with is the thinking, feeling, and willing forces uh, and the imaginary center. But still, I, I have some uh, uh, issues or, or questions, rather, if I, if I may uh, address it. So, um, you know, in, in your video now that you spoke about, you held the mug in a specific way uh, when you were a thinking character and a feeling character and a willing character. Now, um, does that come with practice of the psychological or the archetypal gestures? So how do I, uh, as an actor, how do I, uh, you know, uh, uh, probably draw the arc of the character that, okay, uh, so in my case, this, this guy who I'm playing in this TV soap opera is more of a thinking character. And I had figured that out while I was reading the text and the script, you know, when we started off in December, that this guy is not a very feeling or a willing character. He is more dominant by. Ooh, I lost you, Rohan. There Sorry, you. I was getting a call. I just disconnected. So I was saying, so it, it, when I was reading the text, I, I understood that this guy was a, was a thinking character and he um, is more dominant. Uh, by his wife, who makes him do things and creates conflicts within the family. Okay, so he is basically obeying a very dominant wife. Okay, so I understood that he, you know, he's not really uh, moving as much. Uh, but still, when it comes to, um, as you mentioned, you know, figure out uh, and, and manipulate a certain way, you know, with, with your gestures, okay, um, how do I how do I um, block that in my head? I mean, my I guess what I'm trying to ask is, uh, if I am going to have the right justice for a thinking character and a feeling character or a willing character, you know, uh, probably a willing character may also be thinking and doing things, maybe maybe in in different proportions. So how do I how do I uh, you know? Uh, fix these gestures that okay this is what my playing area is and he's a thinking character so he would be probably not moving you know like in in a in a, in a very uh, you know different way so how do i fix those gestures you know that is something that i am uh, not very clear with because i'm still in the process of understanding and and uh, and and figuring out these gestures so how how does how does one do that a thinking character or any character for that matter like how am i holding a cup or how am i putting the hand on on my on my forehead or or whatever how do you come to those conclusions that okay a thinking character would essentially be behaving in these manner mannerisms how, how does one come to that conclusion so the the shortcut to it literally is is to watch the different um videos that i've put out on thinking, feeling, and willing, the trinity of the psychology. Um, right. Because the because one of the things that distinguishes uh, my work, the, the uh, National Michael Chekhov Association pedagogy, the NMCA pedagogy, is, uh, is, is that I had developed the work with very, very specific physical and uh, audio processes so they are revealed in these videos and in these videos there and there are some long ones where that we talk a lot about the theory of it but there are short ones where we really just do the the elements these elements are derived from observation 
So mm -hmm. over many, many years of observing and reading uh, so the, a lot of these ideas and observations are based in Rudolf Steiner's work, which very heavily influences Michael Chekhov's work. And uh, the, the thinking, feeling, willing is something that, I mean, it, uh, it, it's um, mythical in terms of you, you look at your trinity of, of, uh, of gods uh, from, from, you know, from almost every tradition, Indian traditions, Tibetan traditions, Christian t traditions, um, Scandinavian traditions, you have these three forces and represented right. by three major gods. And, um, and so it's not just Mr. Chekhov or Dr. Steiner. It, it really is something that is observed in the human being, the psychology. And uh, so when you look at the cliche, uh, the stereotype of a really thinking, a person who's just all about thoughts, you start to see uh, these tendencies that are consistent, again, across, across cultures and uh, across genders. It just doesn't matter, culture or gender, these movement patterns are the same. Right. And so I've identified those and we talk about those and we practice them. We walk around just, you know, pointing and walking in straight lines and leading with the head and we exercise that process until it, we get very, very clear on, uh, on what those are. And we practice them in the stereotype, in the cliche, because every cliche or stereotype bears its archetypal truth. And that's right. on, only because the archetype is in there does it get repeated enough that it can even become a cliche or a stereotype, a replication of the archetype stereo. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is a matter of exercising and drilling. And so I, I, for the early phases, more so than understanding the breadth of the technique, it, 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 I would encourage you to get up on your feet and literally practice. And this practice is supported by observations. So for you to take time, and I would start with the thinking forces, uh, to when, wherever you go, and it may be that you're doing it now, but just by watching other people on, on screen in some way, but trying to observe people and identify whether they are in that moment predominated by their thinking forces, their feeling forces, or their will forces. And we all change. So it's only a predominance. So the, mm -hmm. the character uh, is predominantly a thinking force, but maybe he has a soliloquy after his wife leaves and he buckles down into his will and he his will force has been trampled by her will force so his will is a bit crippled while his thinking forces are overdeveloped and for a moment in this soliloquy he's like i am not gonna let her do this to me and he shifts into his will force so right. th these kinds of shifts will happen and mm -hmm. And when, uh, and when you recognize that, it makes really great scenes because we can feel the tension. Um, and that's part of disguises where right. she leaves the room and the camera comes to you and we see you taking off the disguise of being the supplicant husband and finding your own will force and trying to build up the will to defy her which of course is going to ruin your marriage and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, we have all the reasons why you, you, you do as she says. Um, and, uh, and so when you, when you observe that these things are really happening, then your, your own thinking force, Rohan's thinking force actually starts to go, Oh yeah, that really is. Because in the beginning it does seem, mechanical maybe um maybe a little 
contrived and manipulated. But when you see how true these are, that become this these limitations of expression become the perfect boundaries to create a great deal of freedom. And right. then they become very, very creative because your creativity, as we saw, can be expressed in every, you know, the way you relate to your clothing and the way you relate to your props. Mm -hmm. These are two of the main uh, ways that we see who the character is. And, and, it, and, and if, you, if you're caressing, you know, along, along here, that's a very different thing than, than if you're tugging, if you're tugging on a shirt, you know, as a, a, that's a very different thing than caressing it. Right, right. And you, you can see it, right? You can see that's Absolutely. very different, you know, than, than this. So right. it's very subtle that your audiences aren't going to really know. And that's part of the goal of Michael Chekhov's work is to be permeating your audience on deeper levels beyond their uh, ordinary consciousness and working on this super consciousness there. So it right. does uh, require practice. And, and the biggest practice you can do really it are these, these basic psychophysical exercises and these very sort of um, even, I would say, even mechanically practiced thinking, feeling, and willing exercises. And as I said, there are videos, there's a very short video that uh, Will Kilroy- yeah, I have seen partner. one with Will, Will and you, uh, like it was like a four minute video. Uh, That's right. I, I, I did see that, yes, and that was really nice. So it was very stereotypical, but yes, it was about thinking, feeling, and willing, and how he was walking and how you were, using the space yes yeah so i would go back to that over and over again and mm -hmm. there are um videos where the chart is and the chart outlines all the language patterns the energy patterns the locations uh, the center points for each of those really really practice that and like i said just when you when it gets drummed into you when you're when you observe it then you go, aha, it is true. And then you, then you feel artistically freer to do it. Right, absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, there's no, no amount of reading, like I encourage, absolutely encourage reading, but no amount of reading is gonna substitute for the actual process of being up on your, seat, up on your feet, doing the exercises and flying back because right. Even if you don't use these techniques I've suggested, the flying back process is going to become a savior. Building the skill set to be able to do your imaginary playback, playback for yourself. Yes. That, that requires practice and you do it in your home, what we call home play, when you play at home with the exercises uh, and, and it's a discipline. It requires one's will force because one, one's feeling force can get so excited by, you know, doing your thinking, feeling, or willing, or, or doing your gestures that you just keep doing them and doing them because they feel so good to do them and, and stuff like that. But if you just keep repeating without reflecting, all you're doing is anchoring habits but you don't know whether that's a good habit or a bad habit. So right. a repetition is the growing power, but it'll grow in whichever direction. So it's reflection upon what you've done that allows you to refine. Okay, so repeat, reflect, refine the process right. so that you really have um, a way of building and getting, getting the muscle of self-witnessing, which is, as I said, part of the split consciousness, which is present in all peak performances. Anyone want to 
unmute and uh, have any questions. Hey, this was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I was taking copious notes, so thank you so much. Um, really wonderful way of like, I think now, especially in the time of COVID, being able to, to use this, I think is great. So I just wanted to say thank you. I don't really have a question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. I would like to have a, one question if, if possible. Yes. Yeah, you thought earlier in the beginning, you said uh, the spy back, uh, three things. Uh, what did I like? Uh, how, what, what was the two other things? Okay, uh, overall, what did I like about what I just did? And yeah. then, and I think of this like an Oreo cookie. So it's like three parts of the, the base. Overall, what did I like? <clears throat> and then if I get to, you know, the, that creamy filling, I like to double stuff it make it fatter, juicier. So <clears throat> how would I double stuff this, this? Meaning how would I make this juicier, more exciting, more fun? What would make me happier if I get to do this again? Um, <clears throat> maybe I'm doing it tomorrow night, or maybe I'm doing it in two seconds in, a, in the next take. <clears throat> so how would I change it? What would I do to, to yeah, th to make it juicier, tastier? And then the top cookie, which is, what was my favorite moment? Okay. What was my favorite moment? Now, those favorite moments are really important because, uh, because you, you want to make sure you get to keep the sparkle. The, that favorite moment sparkles in your imagination, and it's like a jewel. So when you... When you practice, when you do, going back to some of the most basic things, like um, the practice, observe, apply exercise. And on checkoff.net, you can go to resources and there's a, a, a POA journal sheet. You can download that. It's practice, observe, apply. And it, it me, like, so for five minutes, you're going to walk around just being a mechanical um, cliche type of thinking dominated person and uh and then you're going to brush your teeth like a thinking dominated person and then you're going to take a walk and you're going to observe something in the world you're going to look at a pine tree and see wow that is a thinking dominated tree as opposed to the magnolia tree which is clearly a feeling dominated uh, you can see the pine trees like this and the magnolia is like this. So we feel the difference. So practice the exercise, observe it in real uh, life and apply it to something you personally are doing. That process, then when you, uh, when you fly back over it, it, over your day, and you do that, uh, you know, like three times a day, five minutes of exercise, one minute of observation, one minute of applying in the morning, and one minute of observing and applying, you know, that's two minutes in for lunch and for dinner, for example. Um, stuff you have to do anyway, 11 minutes a day uh, to be a practicing observant artist, POA, practice, observe, apply. That at the end of the day, you fly back or spy back over what you've done. And you, and you ask yourself, overall, what did I like about what I did today? Well, all day I was looking at thinking forces and I practiced it. And I understand thinking forces overall much better. What was my favorite moment? Oh my gosh, when I saw this little kid and the mother was just all, all emotional and the little kid said, Bobby, I don't think that what you're doing is right. And it was like, oh my God, you did everything absolutely cliche. That was amazing. You know, that was my favorite moment. Um, and what would I do? Well, actually I forgot around lunchtime to do my exercise. So tomorrow I'm gonna try and remember. You know, you get, you create, you got, you know, you're like patting yourself on the back for having done something and you're observing and learning and noting what you learned. And this is gonna deepen. And if you have it on this morning, midday and evening. It's just 11 minutes spread out over the day. But what it leads to is what Chekhov called the art of continuous acting. So that you as an artist are continuously viewing your world 
through the lens of your art. It's living right. in your subconscious and superconscious that, you know, in five hours, I'm going to do this again. And um, so, yeah, so my partner, Will, likes to flip it, the order. He likes to do the overall and then the favorite moment and then the double stuff. Um, and he's, he's, he has a, he's a will-oriented human being. Right. And so he likes to end with that will, that will force action, right? So that's great. You know, it doesn't really matter. It's three parts. It's a triangle. You could turn them in any order, whichever order you, you like. Most actors, when they do something, okay. um, most actors beat themselves up and they judge themselves with criticality. And this dampens their will to do it. Um, and so when you practice this process of affirming your will force in whatever manner, that is the most important thing, to celebrate what you did well. Find and recognize the beauty. These are elements that are used. They're part of the Four Brothers of Art, this flyback process, to help you nurture your soul in the artistic soul and spirit. Just a, just a quick summary of what I'm taking back from this session, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just for my understanding and, and please uh, correct me if I've missed out on something. So I'm definitely going to uh, do the POA, which is I'm going to download that from the checkoff.net. Um, then I'm going to uh, be uh, uh, exercising or practicing the flyback or the spyback process, which is, um, you know, what was I happy about? Um, how would I do it again? And what was my favorite moment in any order? That's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, and, um, and I've written like so many of them, but one of the most important thing is like uh, trying to f manipulate a, phys uh, a psychological gesture with the thinking, feeling or willing force and trying to uh, figure out a way to, to stick to that and, and uh, manipulate that. And yeah, there's so many else, but I think this is something which is going to help me um, uh, understand or establish the arc of the character uh, in, a, in a better way. And probably uh, I'll be more aware, I guess, with the body movements when I'm doing that on set as well. I, I hope, uh, because like I said, I am going to be practicing it and then doing it. So I'll be more aware and more conscious while I'm going to be performing next time. So yes, uh, this is what I have taken away today. And uh, again, it's a big thank you for putting this up at such a short notice. You're welcome. And remember to talk with your colleagues about yes. uh, moving forward some of the technical uh, situations. Uh, how, to yes. replay, how to create, falling in love with the problem, create a way to do rehearsals, even if they're online, you know, they're in the next room, you're in this one, but you're both on video right. chat with each other, or even just right. the phone, so you can hear and feel each other um, there. Sure, sure. Sound good? Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, people, for joining us. Thank you, Lisa, once again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, look forward to, to future sessions.